in presence in a different way. This is solid dysfunction or a disolid dysfunction, so on and so forth. So, I will be dividing this lecture into the following subheadings that I will be discussing the physiology first, then the etiopathophysiology pathophysiology of RV dysfunction, how you diagnose RV dysfunction, how you ventilate this patient, and finally, how you manage these patients. All right, coming to the physiology. RV is the thin wall structure with the muscle mass about one sixth of the LV. The end diastolic thickness is one third of the LV, and thereby, since the thickness is less, the oxygen requirement and oxygen consumption by the LV RV is also less. It is supplied by all the three coronary arteries, and unlike the LV, where the coronary blood flow is maximal during diastole, the RV receives coronary blood flow both during systole as well as diastole. It's got numerous collateral vessels as well as nutrient blood flow from the Thebesian veins. Now it has been seen that uh, you increase the after load, the left ventricle has got a better tolerance level than the right ventricle in maintaining the stroke volume. As you can see here, once the pressure increases from 100 to 140, the stroke volume decreases only less compared to the RV, where a slight increase from 10 to 30 drastically brings down the stroke volume. This means that the RV is more sensitive to pressure overload than the LV. The RV is normally semicircular and serpentine, whereas the LV is circular. But what happens when the RV is diseased? It assumes a more spherical shape and sometimes the septum can encroach onto the LV and thereby the size of the LV comes down. So, this spherical shaped RV results in an abnormal septal function that also impairs the left ventricular conformance. This is what has a, this is what I was saying as a ventricular interdependence. 